can all agree that that's a reasonable representation of me. In, a, in an awkward twist of events, I'm wearing the exact same shirt as in that photograph, so that I either need to get a larger wardrobe, or plan better, or both. So, I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies, and this is basically just a merit badge for the sheer number of hours spent apologizing for JavaScript's idiosyncrasies. Um, I've been for a year, so I'm more surprised, that, more surprised than they made me one in the first place. I'm surprised they haven't booted me out of the program yet. I work for the research and development team at BBD Software Development, based in Joburg. Um, we do training, consulting, and some industry-based research and development. But I don't think I could succinctly explain to you what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it wouldn't be consistent. But they still pay my salary, so everything works out, right? I am a co-organizer of the Josie.js meetup group. Uh, we meet on the third Thursday or second last Thursday of the month. Sometimes they're the same day. Uh, if you're ever up there, you should totally come have a listen. We have cool spe people like Kenneth speaking, um, and we tackle a whole range of topics. But to be very clear and set expectation, I am a Johannesburg-based JavaScript developer speaking at a Cape Town Ruby conference. You know what you're in for, okay. Right, so what are we here to talk about today? Um, I'm not going to apologize for a potentially clickbaity title. It isn't clickbaity. Okay. We're going to dig in through what this means uh, and try and unpack what these bizarre terms are. So starting at the first one, which is progressive. Progressive is a very, very ambiguous phrase. It can be used to express politics, music, or grammar. But we're all developers here, so I think it's far more likely that you've got the association that I'm talking about progressive web apps. Okay which is a big topic, which we're going to dig into a little bit. But the important part of that is the P, right? And we're talking about the P in progressive web apps. We're talking about progressive enhancement. This is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. And basically, what we're looking at is the ability to progressively use browser features um, if they're available, and fall back gracefully if they're not. Okay? Let's look at the second part. Rails. Now, this is the easy one. Right, this is Rails. Um, I do have Ruby in my toolbox. Um, it's that tool that you pull out and feel incredibly smug from time to time when it's the hammer that hits the nail just perfectly, and then put it back. I have worked on production Rails apps, although my experience is a little bit dated, um, circa 10 years ago, right? Um, I'm glad to note during the development of this talk that not much has changed in Rails, and there's still a lot of black magic under the hood. But the reason why Rails is there, and I'm going to make a bold statement here, is I firmly believe that the DNA of Rails is in every modern web server-side rendered framework, either by them directly copying it, hello ASP.NET, or by their deliberate intention to be different. So in this, Rails serves as sort of a foundational proxy for every modern server-side rendered application. Now let's get to the most innocuous part of it, right, apps. So apps is pretty clear. We know what the web can do. We deliver pages of information. They may or may not have cat pictures on them. Um, this is relatively old, but unfortunately, it's dated, right? That's not what people are expecting from websites anymore. Websites are not just giving me information. I want to touch it. It needs to be tactile. Users expect a whole bunch more, and we need to adapt, for it, adapt to it. So of course, yes, I'm talking about progressive web apps in this, right? Um, and progressive web apps is this broad, amorphous thing that could mean a whole bunch, right? And you've got an association with single-page client-side applications. I'm here to say that Rails can fit into that picture, and so can any server-side rendered application. Now, I can sense that there's a cynic in the room somewhere, right? And is asking that question, okay, fine. But how? Uh, and luckily, I've got an answer. I'm glad you asked. So this is what we send down to the browser front end, right? We send a page with a whole bunch of stuff on it. But that stuff isn't uniform, right? There's some stuff that's fresher than others. Like for example's sake, we've got a header section, we've got a footer section, and some additional navigation or fluff. And those are relatively static, okay? We composite them in at runtime um, with the important stuff, which is the content of our page. Now, this is very familiar to us, so much so that it's second nature, and all frameworks work exactly the same way. So all I'm going to suggest is that we take the next step and say, well, let's composite it still, but let's composite it outside of server-side rendering. Let's composite it on the client side and then cache those things potentially independently. 
Okay? Yes, but how? Luckily, we can make use of the pivotal technology in the progressive web, web app movement, which is that of the service worker. So for those of you that are unaware, the service worker is basically a JavaScript background thread that's disconnected from the foreground thread, but has access to the networking stack. And it can do some really, really clever stuff because of that. So you can basically think of service worker like a reverse proxy for your front end. Okay? Cool. Um, and we can write this code directly ourselves. It's relatively well supported nowadays, but I'm going to use a really awesome abstraction layer to make things more expedient called Workbox. And Workbox gives us some higher order uh, pieces to use to cobble together a solution. Okay. So, let's get on to a demo. So I'm going to write some code. Unfortunately, my typing speed doesn't match Gabriel's, so you're going to have to bear with me. Um, I want to know how you did it. Um, and, <laughs> um, and by very definition, live coding is an audience affair. So you're all in this with me, unfortunately, to the end. Okay, so let's get going. So I have uh, a typical Rails app, right? I'm not a designer. The things that I know about design are dangerous. Uh, I think there are some of you similar to me in this room. Uh, we either work closely with designers who know what they're about, or we use some CAN template that we either pay for or steal off of the internet, right? Um, and this is one such example, which is a typical profile site, um, a lot of which I'm going to leave as is because I don't want to break the CSS. But there's some stuff that we bake in, which is our dynamic bits and pieces, like, for example, take this blog, um, which is relatively archetypal. So we're going to take a look at how to go ahead and turn this into a progressive Rails app. So to start off with, I'm going to stop it to save myself some future pain. And then I'm going to show you, oopsie, close all the stuff that I should have closed earlier. And then show you something that you're familiar with, which is your uh, core layout for your application, right? Now this is your compositor. Um, it's relatively standard. It takes some static pieces like the header and the footer, and it meshes it with the dynamic parts of your application. The only vaguely esoteric thing I've done here is I've extracted the head as well so that I can serve the head separately. Okay? Um, and that head, if we go, oopsie, wrong command. If we go take a look at it, is relatively standard. And we've got some external resources that we're linking to, in this case, Bootstrap. Um, and then some code that gets generated from your, um, your compiled assets and injected in here at runtime, right? And that's using sprockets. The reason why I'm using sprockets in this is because the blog engine that I'm using was using sprockets. Um, I have ideas about Webpacker, but I wasn't going to do that late in the demo preparation. Conference-driven development, like we said. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start slicing this apart. Oopsie without breaking it. So all of this is leveraging off of the Workbox library. So what you would do to start off is to install Workbox CLI, which I've done already, um, and then that gives you the ability to take some shortcuts and show you basically the ropes. We were talking about scaffolding in the previous talk. So Workbox Wizard, other than being an amazingly named command, uh, gives you the ability to prompt you, well, which directory are you going to deploy? Now, we immediately see the, the leaning towards single-page applications in this because I don't necessarily deploy my whole application as a directory. But it is the root of your web app. Now, for this, we all know that Rails has public as its root, right? That's where it serves everything from. And for other frameworks, it's very, very similar. So we're just going to smash enter on that. For the moment, I'm going to say, well, yeah, I'll just pre-cache everything, although that is quite a lot, um, and then save my service worker that's going to be generated in the root of the site that I'm going to be serving. Lastly, I'm going to save my configuration options, and then it's going to spit out a command telling me how I can generate my service worker. Let's go take a look at those bits and pieces first before we go any further on. So we're going to take a look at our workbox config to start off with. Now, our workbox config has those things that we captured, um, but it's not enough. This could get us part of the way, but we want to do something that's far more close to the metal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace some of that with still the same public directory, except be a lot more explicit about which assets we want to pre-cache, which is what are we going to download immediately and save into cache as soon as the page starts downloading, okay? Um, we're going to specify which our source service worker is that we're going to template based off of, and then importantly, 
which is the magical incantation that we're going to look for to put the pre-cash bits and pieces into um, our service worker. Now, the next thing we need to do is create the service worker, and I debate, or the templated service worker, and I debated about where this should go because it's not really an asset. So I decided to put it in the lib folder because why not? So in the lib folder, we're going to create this templated service worker, sw.js, and then we're going to start off with some very, very simple code. We're going to download um, the workbox libraries off of a CDN so that it can dynamically fetch the stuff that it needs, all of its various modules. We're going to set debug information, just in case something goes wrong for a demo. We're going to specify the other part of that pre-cache manifest um, variable so that we can put all of our pre-cache information in here. And then lastly, we're going to root that stuff. Say, okay, cool, when you load up, root it. Now, for purposes of this demo, I'm using skip waiting. I'm not going to go into the detail as to why this is not production grade or why this is a problem, but if you're interested, you, you, we can talk about it afterwards. Okay, so that's going to handle the service worker, um, but I now need to install this in my page when the page loads. So I'm going to go back to that head section and I'm going to include it at the bottom here. And the service worker and any kind of real caching only really makes a difference in production, right? At development time, it's just gonna frustrate everyone. So we're going to use the Rails environment variable that says, is this production or um, uh, development? Then we're going to check in the navigator where the service worker is a thing that exists. Okay, this is the progressive enhancement. If it isn't there, we're not going to do it, and hey, you still have a Rails app. After that exists, we're going to register our service worker, which sits in the root, and then lastly, we've got the other side of that skip waiting hack, which is going to listen to a controller change, which is the service worker changing, and then just refresh the page so it'll download the latest cached stuff. Okay. Um, then from there, we should be enough to be able to see something, right? So now, what we would need to do is we would need to, firstly, go rake assets precompile. I'm missing Gabriel's super typing speed at this point in time. Uh, then we would need to use the workbox CLI and go workbox work uh, inject manifest manifest workbox config and then we would have to go rails s for serve and then pass through the production variable. Now I'm going to use this quite a lot and I've probably made some typos. So I created a rake task a little bit earlier that's going to do that for me. So I'm going to go rake, uh, rake workbox uh, server. And that's going to pre-compile all of the assets into the public directory. It's going to um, generate the, the service worker based off of those pre-compiled assets. And then it's going to serve it in production mode. And when we go back to our site and we refresh, everything still works, which is the perfect scenario, right? Um, and if we look at what it's doing, so firstly, in Chrome DevTools, I can go take a look at the application tab, the service workers, and I can see that there is a service worker that's activated and running. Now, under the cache storage section, I can see that there's a pre-cache that has a whole bunch of stuff already in it. Um, and when I take a look at the network panel, and I reload the page, we can see that all of my static textual assets are being served from the service worker, which is pretty cool. So as soon as the page starts parsing the first byte, registers the service worker, it will go and eagerly fetch those things and save them in cache. Um, and that's awesome, but there's still a whole bunch of stuff that isn't, which is notably all of our images, okay? So let's add some dynamic runtime caching for those images. So for the runtime caching, I'm going to again go to my service worker, and then at the bottom here, just register a root using Workbox, okay? Now when you register a root, you need to provide it three things. The first thing that you need to give it is a regex incantation for which roots we're going to match. Um, then we're going to register a strategy, and then last thing, we're going to specify which HTTP verb we're going to listen to, okay? When you register a strategy, there are three primary options for you, which is either cache first, so hit the cache, and if it fails, hit the network. Network first, hit the network, and if it fails, hit the cache. Or stale while revalidate, which is hit the cache, return the cache, then go fetch from the network and update the cache if possible. In this case, the images are not necessarily going to change as frequently once they're created, so we're going to specify cache first. We specify where we want to put it, which is the cache name, and then we're going to add this plugin. And this plugin, which is very useful, lets us say, well, I only want to keep the last 60 images, okay? Which is great. We can now cancel, 
rerun the server, which you can't see because I didn't scroll to the top. I'm really sorry, I'm a bad person. Um, and then when we go to our site and reload it, after, oh damn it, I missed something. Should have shown you it installing the new service work in the application. Um, but anyway, I'll try and remember that next time. So now if you take a look at it, you'll see that all of the images are serving from the service worker, not directly off of the network. Um, if we go take a look at the application tab, we can see the images in cache storage, and there are all the images separately from the pre-cached items, which is pretty useful, right? And this will give us a very tiny bump in performance on first page load and a reasonable bump in performance on um, second and subsequent page loads. For example, if we take a look at it, it's going down from 187 kilobytes on first page load to nine kilobytes on second page load, which is pretty cool, but this is something you could have done with HTTP caching, right? Um, so not very exciting and not why we're here today. Why we're here today is to do the compositing part. So for the compositing part, I'm going to start off by going to my application controller. Because I didn't know where else to really do this and I'm not a Rails expert. So in my application controller, I'm going to create a number of fragments. Uh, I think it was five. Yes. So I'm going to create a number of fragments that represent the parts of the page, starting with the head, then the header, then the header, and then the footer. Okay, footer. Which is awesome. Um, and then I'm going to go to every single one of the pages. So for example, say in the article controller, I'm going to then add the ability to listen to a query string parameter and then disable the layout if that query string parameter is pre uh, present. And I'm gonna do this basically on every controller in my site. And I can probably meta program this away. Okay, so there it is on the blog controller and then on the home controller. So if I go take a look at what that does, once it's started up, I can then, firstly the site still works, and then secondly, if I then specify fragment equals true, I get just the dynamic parts of the page. And the same goes, for example, the header and the footer, okay? Um, the next part is the interesting part, and which is how I'm going to define my caching strategy on the service worker. So on the service worker, I'm going to go down here and specify two strategies which is a content strategy, so the stuff that dynamically changes with the page, and then the page strategy, which is the static bits and pieces. And the content strategy is going to use stale while revalidate, because rather quickly serve stale contentful data and then update it, than try and have a delay. You know, we want to get the time to interactive as fast as possible. And now to combine these two, I'm going to use a streaming strategy. And that streaming strategy um, is something that uses the JavaScript Streams API under the hood. Now the JavaScript Streams API basically lets us start returning page content while things are asynchronously still busy resolving, which is pretty awesome, so we can get that first byte really early of our page. Um, it's weird and it lets us mix promise and non-promise based stuff interchangeably, but it sort of hangs together. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the head with the page request strategy and just request the head. I'm going to uh, replace the header with the page request strategy and replace the header, and then the footer much the same. Uh, nine, and then footer. Lastly, I'm going to replace the body. And that's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to use, firstly, an async method, and then whatever URL comes through as a parameter, I'm going to append fragments onto that URL and then make the request using the content strategy and all of its caching associated with it, okay? So once I've done that, I have to actually use the strategy and I'm going to specify the three URLs, uh, the three URLs that I care about. I could probably make this a little bit neater because they're all using the streaming strategy, but basically it's just the blog, any article that is a suffix of the blog, and then the root of the site. After this, I can just go and, oopsie, rebuild the assets, re-inject the manifest, and reserve, and then when I reload, go to the root of the site, um, 
and I go to, for example, say, firstly, it's still working, and then when I go to a specific page, and I go take a look at the application section, we'll see that we now have not only the pre-cache and the images, we've got the page cache, which is the various static bits and pieces of the page, and then the content, which is separate. Now, what's cool about this is for the first, line, the first time I can now go offline and still see the page work offline. I can still use the sites that I visit, or parts of the site that I visited. Oh. I haven't visited the home page after the page caching was fixed, so now obviously things fall apart, right? Because now I'm getting a cache miss. But that's luckily something we can fix really, really, really easily. Okay, uh, let's go off or online again, just so that I save myself some panic and heartache later. Um, so if I go here and I can simply just use an async await feature um, instead of this. And the async await feature I have is just going to wrap an await of the content strategy make request in a try catch. Okay, and then following that, I'm going to, if that fails, just match the 404.html page, which was already there and is a Rails default, right, in the public folder. Now, luckily, what that means is I can rebuild this site. And then wait for the awful page flash to show that the new service worker is installing, activated, and reloaded on the page. Um, and now, everything still works. I'm going to go offline. And then if I go back to an article that I haven't visited, for example, I get a decent fallback. Okay, which is relatively lightweight. So this gets us to do a little bit more with our page on top of all of those other benefits. Okay, so that's the demo, which at least worked. Whew. Tick one. I'm sorry it was so slow. I think Gabriel's setting unrealistic typing expectations. So let's look at summary. So firstly, uh, you would get improved performance with this, particularly if you're very careful with it. You'll get a reasonable bump on first page load, and you'd get a significant improvement on second and subsequent page loads. Um, you get network resilience, which is um, amazing. The fact that you can now, if the, the in, Wi-Fi goes down, suddenly your page doesn't lag and break. People can still interact with things. And more importantly, you can query that cache, so you can start queuing your user with an amazing experience saying, hey, these articles are available offline or these ones are not available offline, uh, which is something that's relatively unique and changes the way that people interact with your site. And then lastly and most importantly, if these features are not available, you still have a good Rails site, right? We haven't influenced your site at all, and these are all additive measures, okay? So I'm sure you have questions. I would love to hear them. Um, if you're interested in some more details around this or some more of the caveats around the specifics that I was talking about, feel free to check out any of the videos I've, or, or videos of talks I've given over the last year that delve into some of these features. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to ask and answer questions. I can only smuggle stress balls to Cape Town, unfortunately. You know how Cape Town border control is. Um, and before I forget, because I'm going to be blah blahing about web, I have Firefox Nightly stickers if anybody is interested. Okay, so please come and speak to me. Questions? Yes. Okay. So there's a, that's a very valid point. The guidance is don't store full page HTML. So even what I was doing here was stretching some parts. Um, you want to render as much on the client and as much on the server as possible. That makes sense. And then just, uh, well, uh, you, you want to be very smart about how big those cacheable chunks are because they can start eating up whatever's running on the client side very quickly. And if something updates, um, it will cause a lot of cache invalidation. So keep them as small as possible. So there's nothing that qualifies a thing as a progressive web app. Progressive web app is an awful hype-driven buzzword. Okay. It is. No, it's the reality. There are facets of progressive web apps that we care about. And for whatever reason, damn it, uh, this isn't stopped. How do I end that? Stop that. Um, so, so the thing is that it's a whole spectrum of things that we care about. Let me just reload. Sorry. Trying to multitask now. This is what happens when you go off script, man. I think I'm also offline. Am I offline? Okay, so ignore that. Let's run a new audit while we talk. Um, so this is just very, very specific, looking at the performance characteristics of multi-page applications and how you can start taking those steps. Um, 
those steps can go further. So you can put um, push notifications in this, for example, sake, and take your server-side rendered application and re-engage your user base purely by adding a little bit of JavaScript push notification code and keeping your whole application a Rails app. You can add an uh, application manifest and then suddenly your application is discoverable on something like uh, the app stores that are now busy, including progressive web apps. It can be offline installable. And these are all things that you can do optionally, right? That's the point of progressive enhancement, is use the bits that make sense to you and then um, use them, right? And then fall back gracefully if you don't have them. Um, having said that, I don't know, if you want a thumbs up for somebody saying, great, your app is now a progressive web app, I can give that to you. Um, but other than that, bank that one for later. Um, other than that, like there's no clean cut definition. Do you want a stress ball? Okay, have a stress ball. Sorry, Kenna. Um, dude in the green shirt who had a good question. Stress ball. Yes. Yes. Turbo links is some black magic stuff. Okay. This is, I don't think, compatible with Turbolinks, primarily because I had to disable Turbolinks to get some of it working. That's because I don't necessarily know how Turbolinks works in depth. I think with a little bit of time, you can get them playing very nicely with one another. Um, but you know the Rails way, right? As soon as you deviate off that path, your life becomes orders of magnitude more difficult. So your mileage may vary. Sorry if I hit the camera guy. Good catch. Okay, another question. Uh, at the back. Sorry, dude. I'll get yours now. Yes. It's possible. I'm not uh, a fay with what Acti Active Cable does. I'm presuming it's a WebSocket thing of some kind, right? So you can definitely do that. This plays nicely with WebSockets. Because you must remember that, uh, so that would replace the streaming strategy, but the service worker bits and pieces stay the same. So all you would do is have the WebSocket speak to the service worker, potentially spin up the service worker with a push notification, and then be able to deal with stuff. Okay. Good question. Sorry if I kill anyone. Okay, good catch. I'm out of stress balls, but I'm happy to take more questions. That's a super good question. Okay, I'm gonna show you a thing here. Um, clear storage. Okay, so that's a very, very good question. Now, different browsers have different heuristics around how much you can store and how invasive that is. So your choice of browser makes a concrete difference here. Having said that, there are events that you can listen to from an API perspective and do the right thing if the browser is going to purge um, data from the user database for, or from the user file storage. Um, having said that, I was not prompted and you will not be prompted as a user to accept these things. They're just browser standards. Okay. But it's your onus as a developer to behave well in user space. I think one of the the design ideals of progressive web apps is that you treat the user like you would in a native app, which is, it's your device, you're the boss, you're the king. Okay, so we're going to behave ourselves in your playground. Anyone else? Okay, awesome. Catch me, I'm happy to talk about web, and I've got stickers. <laughs>